Welcome to Talking Beats with Daniel Lalchuk. That's me, and I'm so glad you're here. If you like what we do, I'd love it if you gave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And if you're so compelled, write a review. That really helps, and maybe tell a friend or family member. They might like the show as much as you do. If you want to get involved in the program, visit our website, talkingbeats.com, and click Support the Show, where you can make either a one-time or a recurring donation. As we look to continue having cliche-free conversations of real substance with a diverse range of the world's most compelling people, your support is so appreciated, especially as we look to expand and increase our offerings. If you have a question, comment, or thought, Find us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Or if you wish to reach out directly, email me at daniel at talkingbeats.com. I'm so glad you're here. Let's get on with today's conversation. On today's program, mathematician Steven Strogatz, the author of a number of books including Infinite Powers, How Calculus Reveals the Secrets of the Universe, and the Joy of X, a guided tour of math from one to infinity. He is known for his ability to express and articulate verbally the elegance and quiet beauty of his complex field. This passion for mathematics is evident not just in his books, but also in his teaching of many students, first at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and now at Cornell University, where he serves as professor. I'm pleased to have him here. Stephen Strogatz, welcome. Thanks very much, Daniel. It's a great treat to be with you. Take us back to childhood and your Uncle Irv. He gives you a problem. <laughs> he gives you a word problem. I think you know where I'm going with this. Uh, sure. And, and you're 11 or 12. And you happen to get it wrong. Here, I'm just going to say what the problem is, and I'm going to uh, give it all to you. Here it is. It's called the bathtub problem. If the cold water faucet can fill the tub in half an hour and the hot water faucet can fill the tub in an hour, how long will it take to fill the tub when they're running together? Uh, t- talk to us about, uh, first of all, the, the straightforward answer to this, uh, and, and then explain how this is a classic problem that can also be approached with more creativity, with more playfulness. Uh, talk to us. <laughs> Well, sure. Um, If you don't mind, I'd also like to tell you about the little trap I fell into, because as you pointed out, I did get it wrong at first, and it it made a lifelong impression on me. I was so embarrassed by my wrong answer that it it made me want to keep thinking about it and try to figure it out until I really understood it. So, okay, so just to remind you, um, right, so one faucet fills the tub in a half hour, the other in an hour. So Uncle Irv says how long when they're running together. Now, you could imagine what a child might answer to that. I mean, there's a couple things a child might say, right? If one takes an hour and the other takes a half hour, you might think, well, maybe I should add them. So we'll take an hour and a half. (laughs) Well, that's pretty silly. (laughs) Fortunately, I didn't say that because, I mean, just one of them running on its own could do it in a half hour. So why would it take longer if they were working together? Okay, so I didn't say that, but I did make the mistake of thinking that the average was sort of the right concept. So I said 45 minutes and Uncle Irv chuckled and, you know, said what I just said. No, of course, that can't be right either. It has to be less than a half hour because the other faucet is helping. So I didn't really know what to do. And then he said, okay, Stephen, here's how you should think of it. Think about how much each tub would fill in, say, one minute. Okay, so the one that takes 30 minutes to fill the tub would fill a 30th of the tub in one minute. That's a confusing concept, a 30th, but but that's what it would have to be, right? 30 minutes to fill the tubs. Enough for your pinky toe, maybe. (laughs) Yeah, something like that. (laughs) Um, The other one, which takes an hour... In one minute, it would only fill one sixtieth of the tub. And now those two are both contributing at the same time. So together they fill one thirtieth plus one sixtieth. Now for someone at my age, that already was a confusing arithmetic problem because, you know, how do you add those fractions? But, you know, we're taught in school how to do common denominators. And so in this case, the common denominator would be, I suppose, 60. And so one thirtieth is two sixtieths. And if you add that to the 1 60th, you get 3 60ths, and 3 60ths is 1 20th. So that means 
that in one minute together they fill one twentieth of the tub, which means therefore twenty minutes to fill the whole tub. And so twenty minutes is the right answer. And so that's that's the uh, explanation Uncle Irv gave. And I, you know, I, I could see that that was right. It makes sense. It's less than thirty. But I was I was really bothered at the way he laughed at me because it made me feel stupid. And and he wasn't a bad uncle. He was a good guy. But um, it really sort of stung. And so over the years, I, I tried to think about it. Is there some more intuitive way, more common sense way to think about this than um, this business with the common denominators? And, and actually, there is. And so this shows a little bit of how math can be creative and fun. If you really, even elegant, you know, if you look at things the right way. So here's here's an elegant way to think about it. Make the mental leap that, that bathtubs, that there could be more than one bathtub. Maybe like the bathtubs are on a conveyor belt and, and they're going by the faucets getting filled up. Um, so like if you watch for one hour, the one that fills up one tub per hour will fill up one tub. Whereas the faucet that fills up a tub in 30 minutes will fill up two tubs. And so altogether, they will fill up three tubs in an hour and therefore one tub in 20 minutes. And, and that's just a much more... I find, you know, a very, first of all, a very easy way to see why the right answer is 20 minutes. But it also is imaginative because you have to fantasize a little about these movable tubs that can go past the faucets. Anyway, so, yeah, that was a formative experience for me. <laughs> so take us forward a little bit to, to Princeton. You, you've spoken about uh, an experience with a professor there uh, who offered a rather dry approach. Uh, you were sort of left in the dark. You were wondering... What's wrong? Why aren't I understanding this to the degree I should be? Uh, wh what did you learn from this professor? What didn't you learn, both mathematically and as it applies to teaching? Hmm. It's interesting that you're focusing on these um, moments. They really were singular and, and very important moments in my development. These were times when I either got embarrassed or humiliated which I think some of your listeners may be able to relate to this, that there, for many people, math can be an aversive or humbling experience where we're made to realize we're not that smart. Um, I would say not just my listeners, but also the person you're speaking to right now. <laughs> is that so? I, I, can you tell me a little about your own? What is your own past with math? I think you would analyze it and just see a very classic picture of, 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 of struggle, of not understanding, of, of trying to, you know, when you describe math in another interview is, is uh, more of a web than a tower, and, and I thought to myself, well, how many times have I fallen off the tower? How many times did I fall? Not have I, because I, I'm not involved in math these days, but, but you know, growing up, when, when you, you think you're almost there, almost at that next level, and you ask the teacher in a help session after school or something, and it turns out that your question exposed you for knowing so little that one one time I, I received the response, it's it's time to go back to building block one. And I thought, oh, God, what, how I just destroyed my reputation <laughs> by asking such a stupid question. I didn't think it was stupid. I just, I thought I was actually on the verge of, of getting to that next level. Uh, uh -huh. but, yeah, I'm sure you've heard this a lot. And, and I was the, the classic, everybody says, uh, well, musicians must be good at math. I, I, I find that uh, to be something I've never understood or related um, to at all. Or maybe I just had bad teachers. <laughs> That's I, well, I wonder about that because I almost was going to bring that up, too. I, I would think that someone with sensitivity to rhythm, to melody, I mean, these are... It's a it's a feeling for structure and pattern, and that's what math is about. And, and music is the, the sonic version of that. Of course, it's very emotional in a way that um, maybe goes beyond pattern, but yeah, it's interesting. I mean, a lot of mathematicians are very interested in music and certainly plenty of great musicians throughout history, composers, right? I mean, they always say Bach was very mathematical and very, but, very, uh, you, yeah. you wonder how much he was mathematical versus how much we can describe aspects of his music as mathematical. I, I, I always of course, you, you can't get into the composer's brain and say, well, what were you thinking here? Uh, mm -hmm. but, but you wonder, would, was he uh, certainly structure for, for Bach, the structure uh, obviously coming from this, this hugely 
serious and, and long Lutheran German musical tradition uh, is its structure is in a way everything. Uh huh. Interesting. And and didn't he also use certain like almost mathematical devices to help him in his compositions, inversions, and retrogrades? And you you know the I don't know what I'm talking about, but he he did. He used it in the writing of fugues, in the writing of canons, in in, in the repeating motives, and and there's a huge math all, all the way up to Schoenberg was a famous example uh, of a composer who who is number obsessed. Uh, and and there's math and symbols well, really all over music, but but I think the basic statement that <laughs> that you're a musician, you must be good at math, which I hear <laughs> all the time, all yes. the time. I, I'm in my early 30s now. I've been hearing it since I ever was seen with a cello at, at five years old. <laughs> uh, I, that I I never quite understood, but. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, it's and it, it, we just know as a fact that many musicians would say the same thing that there is no necessary correlation. That um, and, and likewise, there are many mathematicians who have no ear for music or even particular love of it. Although there is, there does seem to be some kind of overlap. I mean, one. Uh, I realize I haven't answered your question. We'll come back to it, but I just want to mention one other thing while we're kind of riffing with each other and having a little jazz experience. I like it doing it this way. <laughs> um, that, you know, math and music have this other thing in common, which is that they both have prodigies, and not that many fields do. Um, chess has prodigies, too. But there are only really, I mean, it's hard to think of other fields besides math, chess, and music where you have child prodigies. Um, certainly history doesn't. Even painting doesn't really. I mean, it's because it's sort of like you need some kind of life experience in order to be great at those other fields, whereas you can be a pretty good chess player or mathematician or maybe technically speaking musician without having lived. Uh, it's fascinating you, you bring that up. I, I want to ask you about math prodigies. It's not something I, I had planned to ask you about but i i want to go there in a second but in terms of uh, music prodigies you're right you can you can have unbelievable technical ability you can have a a kid of seven years old play the beethoven concerto absolutely to die on the violin now in terms of the life <laughs> life experience you 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 wonder uh well obviously there's not a lot there but in terms of the the expression of the piece uh and the technical mastery of both hands on the violin uh, you can't deny that the level is unbelievable. Then, then the question is, what happens when that person is no longer a prodigy? Because prodigy is obviously only for a young person. What happens when they're 15, 18, 25 years old? Are they able to transfer into a mature adult artist? Sadly, the answer often, often is no. Uh, but mm -hmm. oca occasionally... It happens. I mean, the the most famous prodigy in the history of music is Mozart, and mm -hmm. and and it's it's been remarked by a number of fine musicians over the years that there's there's almost not even different periods of Mozart's output. It's as if he was fully formed from the very beginning. Obviously, you can you can tell well he's a little older now or has more experience or something. But but the basic uh, talent is there right from the start, which is pretty extraordinary yeah wow that is very interesting to think about because i would i don't know that about him that's interesting that that you can see in the mature artist something i mean very much what was already there as the prodigy huh uh well okay maybe we, i mean we can keep going but i i am tempted to try to respond to your question from a few minutes ago let me take a stab at it yes but before um, you do that just remember I, oh, okay. I, i'd love to if you could highlight at some point a, a math prodigy or two, because I think people don't oh, sure. often they they often think music. Okay, there's a, you know a music prodigy, but but what does a math prodigy look like? But we can put that till after what you were going to respond to. So well, we, we can. <laughs> I don't know why not. Let's let's just go there. With that, um, I mean, there's a very famous one in our circles named Norbert Wiener. So Norbert Wiener is not really a name that people necessarily know today. Uh, he was very big in the 40s, 1940s and 50s. He wrote a book called Cybernetics. We, we certainly hear the word cybernetics occasionally, and we often hear the prefix cyber. You hear about cyberspace, cyberpunk. That's from Norbert Wiener. Cyber is a funny Greek word. Probably really should be pronounced kyber. Um, 
which has to do with control. And he, he helped develop a theory of um, math for how you control automatic machines. So it was a big issue in, in World War II when you had anti-aircraft guns that would be automatically controlled to take aim at incoming fighter planes and, and could shoot at them and swivel around and you know stay locked onto them even as the plane took evasive maneuvers so so the development of control theory was a very big thing in the war effort but wiener who was born in the i think like maybe late 1800s early 1900s was a um a child genius a child prodigy of math and not just math i think also he knew many different languages i mean almost like john stuart mill who knew lots of languages when he was a little kid um so wiener was was an enormous prodigy um, but he had a lot of the deficits that prodigies often have, sort of being a very obnoxious person, um, but very narrowly focused in some ways, difficult to deal with personally. He always stayed that way, but he did grow up to be one of the great um, mathematicians and thinkers of the 20th century. Um, so he did not burn out. I mean, many prodigies you don't hear of because they they do flame out or their interests go in other directions later on. I wonder what what did he do as a kid that was so impressive? I, obviously, just being a polyglot would would be plenty to be very impressive. What, what what mathematically strikes you from his childhood, from his youth that that you look at him and you say, "Wow, that that was really beyond the level of a, a talented kid at math." Hmm. That's a good question that I don't think I can give you a good answer to. Um, he was known as a prodigy, but. I can't think of any great mathematical accomplishments of his at a young age. And I wonder if that's because they were so overshadowed by these things that he did later, you know, with, with the relation between machines and people and control theory and all that. So if he does have some great math results from his early teens or even preteens, they um, – I'm not familiar with them. I'm I'm embarrassed to say, you know. <laughs> well, he I sounds, brought up a bad example. He but, sounds very uh, ahead of his time in any case. Uh, he was. He was. He's a very 21st century thinker in some ways. Um, he was recognized as a as a genius back then. He, like I say, he was very big in the 40s and 50s. He did his work was featured in the front page of the New York Times. I mean, he was at the time regarded as a genius comparable to Einstein, who was the standard for genius in the 20th century, scientific and mathematical genius. But um, I don't know. Anyway, he's now more or less forgotten. There are people who are interested in the history of engineering and math and science who will know his name. But yeah, he's a little bit obscure. He was also quite a character. I mean, they tell a story of him that um, he was enormously forgetful and absent-minded and had very big, thick Coke bottle glasses and, you know, like blind as a bat, really, not athletic, very uncoordinated. And the old story was that he was, because he was so famous, pretty much everyone on the streets of Cambridge, Mass, where he was a prof professor at MIT, everybody knew Professor Wiener. And he was um, looking for his car one day. Uh, you know, he'd parked it in some enormous parking lot and couldn't, couldn't find his car because, of course, he is absent-minded. So he decided he's going to walk home. But then he realized he doesn't really know where he, how to get home. And so as he's walking aimlessly on the streets, he encounters a little girl and says, um, little girl, I'm Professor Wiener. Can you point me in the direction of my home? And she says, of course, Daddy, I'll take you there myself. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, now, whether uh, it's true or not, we don't know, and it's probably an embellished version of some true story. But anyway, all right. <laughs> so, P Professor Strogatz, <laughs> I, 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 I want you to go back to what we were going to mention before, but, but you mentioned streets, and, and Cambridge is not a grid, <laughs> uh, but New York is a grid. Uh, yes. And you talk about grids and directions and patterns. Uh, do you know where I'm going with this? Can you talk a little about oh, this? Sure, I could guess. Yeah, I could guess. <laughs> okay, so go for it. Okay, so you, you, I'll, I'll pose the question to myself then, maybe? Exactly. Don't uh, pose any question to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the geometry of grids came up in my, my teaching work just recently. I was teaching a course that was aimed at students who um, 
have to take a, a math course at Cornell to graduate. That everybody in the College of Arts and Sciences has to take at least one math course or something quantitative. It's considered something that every educated person should know at least a little about. A lot of students, though, who, who had bad experiences with math in high school or elementary school dread having to take this, pass this requirement. And so we created a course for them called Mathematical Explorations that was designed to show them the, the pleasure and beauty and, and power of math in a way that's very different from anything they ever encountered before. And, and one of the activities that we did in this course was uh, I have the students sitting around at tables of maybe five or six students at a table, and they work on problems together, and I don't lecture to them at all. I just give them interesting little puzzles to think about and show them that they have the power within themselves to just figure things out if they, they just think and struggle for a while. And it's a real confidence booster, and it shows them actually the true nature of math, which is that you don't memorize you know, wisdom of someone before you, you, you do some of that, but really it's about being creative and thinking and wrestling with tricky problems on your own. Anyway, so the question I gave the students was, imagine a, a place like New York City where uh, streets are laid out on a grid. And if you want to say how far is some place from some other place, it's not common to say the distance as the crow flies because you can't, you're not a crow. You don't get to fly. You have to go a certain number of blocks north or south and a certain number of blocks east or west to get to the destination. So people often measure distance in blocks, which is a different notion of distance than the one we're used to, straight line distance, where you could imagine going through buildings. Uh, but of course, that's not possible in New York. So my question to the students was, imagine a, a notion of distance where all you can do is measure things vertically, blocks north and south, or horizontally, blocks east and west, and now tell me what does it look like if I ask you, what is a circle with respect to this concept of distance? In other words, say, what's the set of all points three blocks away from here? What does that look like geometrically? And what would you call that shape? So, okay, that's a set of points equidistant from a given point. That's what we would call a circle. But if you draw all the points that are three blocks north south, east, or west, and not just that, but also like two blocks north, one block east. If you, if you map out all these points, and I had the students start doing this on graph paper, they see that it makes a diamond. It, I mean, it makes a shape that looks like a tilted square, which seems really weird to them because it's not round. I mean, they think a circle should be round, but in this geometry, a circle is sort of a tilted square. And not only that, but if you ask, well, what's pi? You know, pi is the ratio of the circumference of a, quote, circle to the diameter of a, quote, circle. If you do that for this funny generalized concept of a circle, you get that pi is equal to 4 in this geometry rather than the usual 3.14 that we all memorized in school. So the, the point of this example is to show that there is more than one kind of geometry, that using your imagination, you can create new definitions of distance, or and, and they can be very natural. Like in this case, very natural for cities laid out on a grid. All right, so maybe I'll just pause there to see if this was the example that you had in mind. Is this what you wanted me to talk about? Exactly, and I'm just thinking, wow, had I had a math teacher like you at some point when I was growing up, my life might be very different <coughs> now, or, or at least I wouldn't have, have struggled and, and suffered so much. Um, but I didn't have you, so l luckily I, uh, <laughs> I do now temporarily. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. The students, it is a very transformative experience for the students in this class because they do see that math can be fun and really thought provoking. And a lot of them say that afterward or even while the class is happening. And, and one of the things I love best about teaching that class is that um, I can remember one time with a different puzzle where I had the students doing something. And, and they were succeeding, and, and everyone was kind of happy. And then I, it was actually a sequence of puzzles. And when they got to the last one in the sequence, that was a very difficult one. And nobody in the class could do it. And, you know, the clock is ticking. And it's very uncomfortable for everyone, the teacher included. And uh, so this was the first time I'd ever taught this lesson. And, and after 30 minutes of nobody actually solving the problem, I said, would you like a hint? And there were about 30 students in the class, and a few of them immediately and reflexively shouted out yes. 
But then, to my great surprise, all the rest of the class shouted even louder, no, they did not want a hint, because they had already solved a bunch of problems of this type, and they thought, like, if you'll pardon me, like, God damn it, I should be able to solve this. <laughs> and they didn't want a hint, even though they'd already suffered for 30 minutes. It was a kind of good suffering that, you know, for people who like to do Sudoku or crossword puzzles or wrestle with anything else, we know that puzzle solving can be pleasurable, which might surprise people who think math is just agony. Um, of course, I want a hint. Not when you're really into it. When you're really into it, you don't want a hint. You want to figure it out. And so I was really you know, thrilled with the student's reaction because it showed that they were having a true mathematical experience, not this fake thing that we make them go through in so much of elementary and, and middle and high school. I want to ask you about teaching math to the general public, which you do through your books, which you do uh, in columns on the internet. You had a series for, for the New York Times. Uh, but but do you want to go back to, to Princeton briefly and, and talk about the impact that this class had on you, or, or is it too sure. painful? No, it's good. It's really, I think it's very helpful because it, it helped develop empathy in me that has been very valuable for me throughout my teaching career. So, I, yeah, I was class of 1980 in college, so I guess you should picture me in 1976. I was, well, I would have been, um, gee, now I have to do a subtraction problem. I guess I was 17, 17 or 18 years old. Well, where, I started are college. I know. where are you from originally, Professor? Oh, well, I'm from a, a town in Connecticut called Torrington. It's in the northwestern part of Connecticut. It's a factory town of about 30,000 people. Uh, my dad owned a shoe store there. He didn't go to college, neither did my mother. They were children of the Depression. So they never really understood what I was doing when I would say I wanted to be a math professor. Um, <laughs> but they were very supportive of it. So you, so you go over... Uh, you go over uh, about a hundred, couple hundred miles, maybe uh, over to Princeton. Um, yeah, through Connecticut so right, so into Princeton, New Jersey, and you arrive in 1976. Take it away. Yeah, so I'm in there in 1976. Had a, a self image as a math guy. You know, I had been good at math in high school, and I think it's probably what helped me get into Princeton. So I expected I'm going to eat up all these math courses, and it's going to be fun. And I, I was thrilled to take what was a, called the honors linear algebra for the, the whiz kids from high school. And little did I know that Princeton viewed this as a course to weed out those kids who were good at math in high school, but really didn't have the right stuff to be a professional mathematician. Th this course was designed to be a training ground, like a boot camp for people who really had the right stuff and, you know, could go on to be spectacular professional mathematicians. So right away, um, they gave us one of the worst teachers in the department, someone who was pathologically shy. And um, yeah, I remember him walking in on the first day, and he didn't make eye contact with anyone in the room. He sort of slithered along the wall. He, he really didn't want to have any human contact, as far as I could tell. And he just began the course with the definition at the beginning of linear algebra, defining an object called a field. No motivation, no welcome to Princeton, no overview, this is what we're going to be doing this semester, just straight into the heart of this very abstract subject. And um, within a few minutes, I had no idea what was going on. There were no pictures drawn. I mean, everything was just very formal and tight and, um, like I say, abstract and disembodied. And so I, I had trouble with this course, and I would try to read the textbook. I couldn't understand the textbook, which was equally dry. And I started doing badly on the homework and badly on the tests. And and it was a really demoralizing experience. And it made me think, maybe I'm not any good at math. And um, maybe I don't even like math. I also had the sensation before each test of tremendous anxiety, knowing I was going to get crushed. And, you know, having to go to the bathroom with nervousness. And So I started to understand when people hate math, or at least math class, what is it that they hate? Well, I was starting to feel some of those bad feelings myself. And, you know, I, I sort of, when I think back on it, I, I'm amazed at my naivete. Like, why didn't I ask for help? Why didn't I go to the teaching assistant? Why didn't I work in a study group with other students or go to the library and look at a different book? I mean, there were so many things I could have done to make it better for myself, but it didn't occur to me to do any of them. 
And that's a reality. I mean, sometimes freshmen don't know to do these very obvious things in retrospect. Anyway, so so it was a very bad experience in some ways, but in some ways a good experience because it made me realize that um, we need to be compassionate to, to our students. We They don't necessarily know much, even if they were good uh, at math in high school. And it also makes me really resentful of the attitude in education that says we should weed out people as if people have some native ability. Um, I mean, yes, there is such a thing as native or natural ability, but but there's also such a thing as a good teacher who can help a student, encourage a student, and, and help them fall in love with a subject. Um, I like to think, I, you know, although I was weaker in some ways than the other students in terms of pure talent, I loved the subject more. I ended up sticking with it and, you know, to this day, still love math and have become a math professor. So, um, but it gives me a lot of sympathy for, for students who struggle. This, this course. So I think it was a great experience on the whole. You know, it reminds me of all the times I wonder what great pianist, what great singer, what great oboe player I'll never hear because they were crushed by a teacher who said, I'm going to weed out, do the weeding process uh, like like you're talking about. And I'm sure there's, there's a whole other parallel universe uh, of people we'll never hear of who are just wonderful musicians who were crushed. Uh, huh. is, and, that, is that actually a phenomenon? I mean, are there music teachers who would have a view like you're describing? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I remember when I was uh, when I was uh, about five, when I was in kindergarten, uh, I was going to kindergarten in Jerusalem and I had a very tough Russian teacher who told me that I had to practice just holding the bow, not even putting it on the string, just holding the bow. This is a kindergartner for five yes. hours a day, only the bow, or else I'd have no really? chance at a career. Oh, that's a perfect example. I mean, that shows such stupidity at the level of human motivation. I mean, I can understand technically what that teacher was thinking, <laughs> yeah. but th that is such a dumb idea. Uh, it, it, the, the old Russian school was like that, but I think, uh, and obviously produced many wonderful string players, but, but you have to wonder if... If the whole point is to get the student, to get the kid into music and, and to nurture the love of music, uh, then you have to walk a very fine line. You have to be tough and you have to show what standards are. But uh, you can't say sit in a chair for five hours and simply hold the bow. Uh, to me, that's... <laughs> <laughs> it's a really great example. I want to use that in future discussions if I, uh, you know, because... Mathematicians sometimes use this kind of thing. There's an essay that I would encourage your your listeners to find on the internet. It's free. It's a PDF file, and it's um, from a great high school teacher named Paul Lockhart, who teaches in Brooklyn, um, and it's called A Mathematician's Lament. And The Mathematician's Lament is, is an essay in which Lockhart talks about this very thing that you've described, um, except I think he's imagining it. He talks about an art teacher who um, gives his students color by numbers exercises, but, you know, never lets them paint their own picture. Or, or you know, a music teacher who only has students look at sheet music, but they can't play an instrument. They're not allowed to do that because first they need to master the reading of music on a sheet without ever hearing it or playing it. Mm. And it, it seems to me so analogous to this this uh, teacher would hold the bow for five hours, but don't you dare play the violin. <laughs> the, the, and, and imagine for, for someone in kindergarten to, to sit still for five hours. I mean, I was a very active kid, but even for a non-active kid, I think that's uh, a lot to ask. Um, luckily, I, I, I went away from the Russian teacher to a wonderful French teacher who was much more uh, accommodating and understanding and nurturing. Uh, so I, I think it all worked out. I'd have been with the Russian of forever, uh, maybe I wouldn't be in music now. Um, but uh, well, I, let me just bring. I mean, because it's an interesting discussion. Some some folks here may be thinking, look, the Russian school did produce, as you say, great string players, and so it's selected for people who could get through that particular filter, and and many of them may have been wonderful. But this kind of selection filter. Um, does, well, if you want to call it weed out, or does select against a different sort of person who may have as much potential. Uh, and 
I mean, I can sort of see the rationale for this, that that if you think that music involves many component parts, many separate skills, many techniques to master, in a way, there's some logic in this. You would break things down to the elemental steps and try to master those, and it would be sort of foolhardy from this point of view to think that the child could really play with any sensitivity. First, you have to master the basics. And we have a counterpart of this in math education that says little children of five or seven or whatever, cannot do creative math, cannot do real math, because first they have to learn how to add and subtract and all the basics. And so there is this constant tension in math education about, do we let students work on rich exercises that are stimulating their mind, analogous to letting a little kid play the violin, versus force them to master the basics of arithmetic before they do anything? And and there are people of goodwill on both sides of this argument. But I feel like the the only sensible answer is you have to do both. The kid has to master technique, but also have the joy of playing the instrument or playing the soccer game or playing the mathematical puzzle solving game. If you don't mind, I give this one quick example that you made me think of earlier when you were talking about creative ways of teaching math in middle school, uh, junior high school. We had very close family friends who were, they were both, a husband and wife from from India, from New Delhi, they were both visiting quantum physics professors at Dartmouth. And uh, it was around the time, I think I was doing fractions, or or could that be fractions and decimals? Maybe it was fifth grade. uh, uh, And I was having such trouble with fractions and decimals, and I I really couldn't get it. And then I had a big project to do and lots of tests and everything, and I went over and uh, Saranjana made homemade chai, and I sat with Jagdish at the table. These are two quantum physicists at Dartmouth, and uh, and he explained it all to me. And I really, <laughs> I got it. I really got it. It was it was a very different explanation uh, from what I was getting in school. Obviously, I I don't think he ever expected to be teaching fractions to a fifth grader or a sixth grader, but it worked. And it was uh, it was really eye opening. I thought to myself, "Wow, if he were my teacher, maybe maybe I wouldn't get bad grades in math if he were my teacher." I, I'm sure that's true. I mean, I really do think that's true. I, I I like your concept of a parallel universe, though it is a tragic picture in a way because I think we have this parallel universe of people whose hopes and dreams were dashed because something about the way they were taught. I mean, it's a match or not a match. I mean, maybe with a different student, the teacher's style was fine, but for that particular student, they were lost. And so that's why sometimes the question of teaching philosophy comes up. Um, I I sort of deliberately have a, the most eclectic possible philosophy that I don't know what's going to work for a given student. So, you know, when I'm teaching math, some people are very visual and, and I, they want to see pictures. Other people have trouble visualizing. They like the symbols. There are people who like applications. They want to know how the math works in the real world. Other people love the history. They want to hear the stories of the great mathematicians and, you know, the struggles they had and the triumphs they had. For some other people, it's a competition. They like the sport of it. They want to compete with someone else in a math Olympiad. And so I don't have any particular philosophy. I know that there are many different things that are appealing to different people, so I just try to push everybody's button at some point. Professor Strogatz, there's so much to cover with you. I feel like I could talk forever with you. Uh, I, just let's let's touch on why you're passionate about communicating your love of math to a wide audience, to the general public, to people who are obviously never going to be in math professionally. What What is it that drives you to do? Why isn't it good enough to just teach students at Cornell and do your own research? <laughs> well... That That is a very satisfying part of my life, too. Um, but there's I, I just feel like I'm bursting with excitement for my subject. I love my subject. Um, a lot of professors feel this way about their subject, whether it's history of art or poetry or sociology or anything else. And I, I, those are the professors that we remember for a lifetime. So it's I just love the subject. And it gives me great pleasure to think about it, to revisit it. And you know how it is when you love somebody or something, you want to tell everybody about that person or about that thing. And uh, it's really, I don't want to make it sound selfish, but there is a little bit of selfishness in it. It gives me happiness to talk about math or to think about it and to share it with somebody. So it's partly benevolent, 
you know, that I feel like I'm giving them a gift if they're willing to receive it. Um, partly I'm trying to seduce them because I think I've got something very seductive to share, but I don't know. I mean, there's just a lot of different motivations. So, and partly I feel like there is this empathy that I talked about earlier that when I think about how I know, because when I meet people, you know, anytime you meet at a cocktail party or just on the street, so many people give you such a sad story when they hear that I'm a math professor or math teacher. They just, oh, God. You know, but what's interesting is they don't say, I hate math. They typically say, oh, I liked math until I got to, and then it's something like, oh, until I got to decimals, those were really confusing, or until I got to algebra, I didn't understand what those letters why were we doing letters instead of numbers? You know, where I was good at math till I did calculus and I hit the wall. So everybody has this place where they fell off. And I just feel like it's, um, it makes me sad. And I, and I also sort of hear the disappointment and the shame and the embarrassment in the person's voice. And I feel like it's so unnecessary. You know, I want them to, um, to appreciate and to not feel sad and to because uh, I really do think math enriches people's lives in much the same way that music does. Um, it's just that it's a less accessible form than, you know, pop music. We can all, well, I don't know, <laughs> maybe I'm going too far, but but that's easy. That's very accessible. People like that. But something like opera, I have to admit, I still don't really appreciate opera. And I wish that I did because I see people weeping at opera. I know that it's magnificent and I feel left out. And I don't want people to feel left out about math the way I feel left out about opera. What are you excited about right now in, in your world, in, in mathematics? What, what do you wake up every day or wake up in the middle of the night passionate and really excited about currently? Hmm. Well, um, it will sound very specialized, but uh, it's the honest answer. I Just this morning before we started to talk to each other, I was entranced with thinking about an ancient problem. It's a problem that's almost, well, I mean, it's like 350 years old or so. It's the, the subject of how things get in sync. How do they keep perfect time with each other? And it began historically with a, an accidental discovery by a physicist named Christian Huygens, who was sick and co confined in his room um, he was, he, I think he had some kind of intestinal problem. But anyway, he, he had built the first the world's first pendulum clocks that really worked and could keep perfect time. And he had two of them in his room, and he noticed that they were keeping the same time. They were swinging in perfect antiphase, meaning when one of the pendulums swung to the left, the other one on the other clock was swinging to the right. And they would just go back and forth like this towards each other, swinging towards each other and then away almost like two hands clapping, you know, towards each other and then apart. And so to explain how his clocks were maintaining this perfect synchronization, he did a bunch of experiments in his room, moving the clocks around the room, seeing if they were somehow jiggling each other through the floor or maybe air currents. They were somehow communicating with each other. And so what I've been thinking about recently is um, trying to use the laws of physics and, and calculus to explain exactly what Huygens observed that day in his in his bedroom. I mean, it's as I say, it's more than 350 years ago now that he observed this, but you might be surprised to, to know that we still have not fully figured out exactly how this works. Um, we have, there many papers have been published about Huygens. It's called the sympathy of clocks, actually. It's a very beautiful phrase. Huygens' sympathy of pendulum clocks is still not fully explained mathematically, and um, great mathematicians have tried it throughout the centuries, and I'm, with a few collaborators, trying to take a whack at it myself. Professor Stephen Strogatz, I want to thank you very much. It's fascinating, and I could hear this for many hours. Well, thank you, Daniel. It's really fun talking to you, too, and, and um, I... Uh, it was a great pleasure. Seriously, thanks for having me on. You've been listening to Talking Beats with Daniel Elchuk. The original theme music is by Ronald Barco. The content coordinator is Nathaniel Mose, and Doug Christian is executive producer. We invite you to subscribe and leave a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. You can support us 
at patreon.com slash talking beats. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash talking beats. And be sure to check us out on social media. We'll see you next time on Talking Beats with Daniel Elchuk.